Welcome to this week's edition of the Bible in the News. This week, the U.S. has essentially fled Afghanistan. How the world sees it, how Islamic extremists see it around the world, how it is generally being taken is that the U.S. has fled Afghanistan. As the U.S. retreated and essentially fled the country, the Taliban took over faster than anybody imagined it could happen. There was many experts who expected that the Taliban might take over, but the speed in which it happened and the completeness took the world by surprise. The residents of Afghanistan that are left behind, those who are not extreme Islamist fundamentalists, fear for their future. They fear for their safety, and they fear for what will happen to their country. As the Taliban was taking over the country, they found that there was great prizes to be had because the U.S. had fortified, they had um, given arms to the government in Afghanistan. And as it fell and the Taliban took over, all these U.S. armaments fell to the Taliban. They now possess many U.S. planes, helicopters, Hummers, scores of assault rifles. In the United Kingdom, who was, of course, the United Kingdom was um, a party with the U.S. in their occupation in Afghanistan and their attempt to build the government of Afghanistan. They felt completely betrayed and stunned by how the Biden administration had handled this, how they had abandoned their own people, abandoned the, Af the Afghan people, how they had ab abandoned the British people that were left in Afghanistan. Many in the UK have not held back at all in saying how much they disapprove of how things went down. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, attempted to call Joe Biden as this was transpiring for 36 hours before he got any response. The German Chancellor-to-be, Armin Lenschket, says that this is the greatest debacle that NATO has seen since its foundation, and it is an epochal change that we are facing. In Britain, Parliament held Biden in contempt accusing him of throwing the UK and everybody else in the fire in a move they fear will embolden Russia and China. Member of Parliament Tom Tugendhat gave an emotional floor speech in Britain's House floor. One of the things he said in that speech was, like many veterans, this last week has been one that has seen me struggle through anger and grief and rage, the feeling of abandonment, not just a country, but the sacrifice of many, that many of my friends have made. Tony Blair came out and called the withdrawal imbecilic. It's driving America's allies away from them. The, their allies in Europe are now looking inward instead. So it's drawing Europe closer together, which is important from Bible prophecy because the picture we see in prophecy at the end is not a, a, Europe, a Europe that is dependent on the United States, but rather one that is acting freely on its own, more in concert with Russia than across the water. As we consider this from a Bible point of view, it's important that we understand where Afghanistan is. The Bible speaks about a Persian empire that existed in the past, and it speaks about um, some things about Persia for the future. Ezekiel 38, Persia is to be with this king of the north, this northern power that is seen coming down, and they are to be a guard to those assembled unto them. So all those states in the area, we would expect Russia to be a guard to, and also to the entire Confederacy. Russia seems to be taking this guardian role in the time of the end. So if we look where the Persian Empire was in Bible times, in the times of the prophets, and then we look where Afghanistan is today, I've colored it in bright green for you, so you can see where it is. It's just to the east of Iran. And if you look back at the Persian Empire, just to help you get your bearings here, there is the Indus River that I've put a red arrow on. And if we look where that is on this map, you'll see that it is right there in Pakistan. So Afghanistan is just inside the eastern side of the old Persian Empire. Here's just a verse from Scripture to, to illustrate that that was the case um, in the Bible, in Bible times, that it extended from India unto Ethiopia. As all this has gone down, another interesting thing as we consider that, 
we see that Russia is wasting no time in stepping in. They're making overtures to the Taliban and they are preparing contingency plans on the borders. Here's from CBS News. In the Taliban's rapid takeover of Afghanistan following the chaotic withdrawal of U.S. forces this week, Russia sees an opportunity to step up its role as a regional power in its own backyard, but it also faces a host of risks, promoting the country to pursue a dual approach, diplomacy with the Taliban, and displays of strength along its border. So the first one of those then, first approach, prong one, we could say, is to engage with the Taliban. The Kremlin appears to be willing to engage with the Taliban in order to secure its interests. Since the group took over Kabul, Moscow representatives have cautiously reached out for talks to secure its diplomatic compounds in the area. Russian ambassador to Afghanistan, Dmitry Zernov, even publicly praised the Taliban on Russian state TV. He says, we are now being guarded by the Taliban, their big unit, they made a good impression on us, adequate guys, well-armed. They stood along the perimeter of the embassy so that no one could penetrate us, no terrorist, no crazy person, he says. So in a way, that I think that's just kind of like sticking it to the U.S. It's just kind of a bit of a um, trying to rub the point in. But um, the point is that they have positioned themselves to be able to get along with the Taliban well enough to get done what they need to get done. The second prong of Russia's approach is to contain them. So they've, they've had the prong of diplomacy to try and get along with them, but they want to make sure that these crazies are not going to cross the border into other states. So further along in the article, while exploring diplomatic ways to interact with the Taliban, Moscow also made sure to project force by holding joint military exercises in Tajikistan and China near the Afghan border with the latter aimed at demonstrating the determination and ability to fight terrorism. The goal is not to allow the expansion of Taliban outside of Afghanistan and to make the rule of the Taliban as small as possible compared to its previous version. Alexander Bronov, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Moscow Center, told CBS, Russia is not interested in having a new ISIS on its border. The Russian military also announced this week that Russian troops will take part in a month-long exercise with Tajikistan under a collective security treaty with regional states. Moscow has an obligation to deploy forces in case one of those states is under attack. Now, in terms of that prophecy that we read, that Russia was to be a guard to these states that were with her, this is very interesting indeed. I liked the language in this um, little article because it actually uses the word guard. Um, Moscow fortifies positions in neighboring Central Asian countries to guard against any destabilizing spillover. So as we look at this then, there are many angles that this is interesting on. Um, One of them is the U.S. downfall. This event is also widely seen as being a major setback for the U.S. It is at least a very major embarrassment. There in the red, in Afghanistan, the myth of omnipotence of U.S. military power has been destroyed. So the U.S. carries on to use this for diplomatic leverage. The line they are pushing is that the U.S. can't be trusted because they left the Afghan government in the lurch. The headline here from Russia Today, Russia's point of view, America's hasty retreat from Afghanistan should be a warning to Ukraine that it can't count on Washington. Of course, Russia would like the Ukraine to rely on Russia and do what Russia wants, rather than to rely on the United States and be allied with the West. So as we look at this then, the picture at the time of the end that we see is um, these southern powers that are no longer able to uh, to rule the world in the way that they have for years. Um, rather, they're left as commentators as world powers execute their differing will in the world. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13 says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, which can be equated with those areas in the Arabian Peninsula, Tarshish can be equated with Britain, and as it talks about the young lions thereof, those nations that are associated with 
Tarshish, those English-speaking people with um, a British heritage in the past. So at this time then, at the time of the end, at the time when this terrible northern army is coming to have their way against Israel in an awful manner, they protest against them and they say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? to carry away silver and gold, and to take away cattle and goods and a great spoil. Now, in that, there is implied a couple of things. One is that they're either unwilling or un unable to actually do anything. It doesn't say that they come and fight against them, or they're overridden at this time, or any kind of fighting language of any description. Rather, there is a commentary that is given. So the, the implication is that they're either unwilling or, or unable to do anything. The other is that they're closely allied with the South and very likely for this to really, to really be fully fulfilled in the way that this is written. They have to actually be there in the South, probably in Israel, because it says, art thou come to take a spoil, etc. You don't say, are you come if you're not there? Rather, you might say, have you gone? Why did you go? The, the, the language is, is switched for that. Another area of interest to us, of course, is how this affects attitudes regarding to the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Lessons are being quickly drawn by both Hamas and Israel and others involved. Former Prime Minister Netanyahu posted to his Facebook about it, and this is commented on in the Jerusalem Post as well. Former Prime Minister Netanyahu says about this, in 2013, I was contacted by then U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. He invited me on a secret visit to Afghanistan to see how the United States had established a local military force capable of fighting terrorism alone. The message was clear. The Afghan model is the model that the United States also seeks to apply to the Palestinian cause. We have seen how this has gone down in Afghanistan, and it is effectively serving as a warning to Israel and those involved that this is not necessarily a good way to get things done. A little closer to home, Netanyahu didn't have to look as far away as Afghanistan after the 2005 withdrawal of Israel from Gaza. After an election that they had there that Hamas made considerable gains in, they, um, Hamas took over and kicked the rival Fatah was considered more moderate out of Gaza. And this is from this is from Friday, June 15th, 2007. Hamas fighters today basked in triumph after taking complete control in Gaza as the West scrambled for a response to the arrival of Islamist power on Israel's doorstep. In a stark demonstration of the new facts on the ground, a masked Hamas fighter sat down at the desk of the Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen, and declared an end to the Western-backed authority in the Gaza Strip. In an imaginary telephone call to the U.S., a fighter from the Islamist movement armed wing, Is El Din Al Qassam, joked, "Hello, Condoleezza Rice." You have to deal with me now. There is no Abu Mazen here anymore. Another article pointing out how this is the same as what happened in Gaza. Um, here from the Jerusalem Post. What happened over five days in the summer of 2007 cannot be blamed solely on the Americans. Fatah, the movement and security force that had received full support from the West, fell apart in a matter of days. Years later, Fatah members still recall with trauma the way Hamas threw their friends off the roof or tied them up to motorcycles and dragged them through Gaza's pothole-laden streets. Hamas, just like the Taliban, is a, it's a bloodthirsty, demented terrorist group that it doesn't deserve to be any position of rulership anywhere. But according to Bible prophecy, this is not to be the situation in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. Ezekiel chapter 36, here this area is called the Mountains of Israel, and if you, if you look at a map and consider the mountainous regions, although there are various mountains in Israel, the central backbone of Israel is a mountainous ridge that was the core of the old kingdoms of Israel, the Judean province of the Roman Empire, 
and um, and Jewish presence there. It's been the backbone of Jewish presence in Israel over many, many centuries and thousands of years. Ezekiel 36, 1 to 4 says, Also thou, son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, the enemy hath said against you, Ah, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. And then it goes on in verse 9, For behold, I am for you, and I will turn you, and ye shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the city shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be builded, and I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit, and I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people of Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. So the central mountains of Israel are not to fall into Arab hands. We can see their sentiment there that others should possess those areas. They have appointed them to their possession, but rather God has appointed them to bear fruit to, as he calls them, the house of Israel. So that's the story then. That's what's going on. That's the situation with the Taliban and Afghanistan and how it's affecting the world. This is very fresh, and we don't know exactly to what extent it will affect things. It is also affecting Biden's popularity in the States. He's um, dropped about 10 percentage points already in popularity, and people are speculating that this may well be his downfall. U.S. allies are looking elsewhere. America's foes are feeling emboldened and strengthened. Israel is feeling like it can't rely on the United States. People are talking in Israel about how if they, would, if they want to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, they need to do so themselves. So as we see these things come to pass, we, um, we can be Although they, the scenes are terrible and the things are, are not what we would like to see from a human perspective, um, in terms of God's point of view, this is another milestone on the way to the establishment of his kingdom, to the demise of the nations as they trip each other up and as wickedness multiplies upon wickedness and the judgments of God come. What we're seeing is all these, these nations that are anti-Israel joining together, making a big confederacy, coming against Israel, showing their true colors, and then God defeats them in the final battle known as Armageddon. So this is another step along the way. We see the north aligning, the south aligning. We see these countries being dragged to rely on Russia for their security because they, they feel they can't trust anybody else. So Russia is able to fulfill her prophesied position of being a guard to them, because weak themselves, they need somebody to trust in, and they are turning more and more to Russia for this role. This has been Tim Billington with the Bible in the News. Please join us again for more Bible in the News next week. God willing.